It's the 22nd of June, 1935, and some very important cargo has just arrived in Australia's far northeast, all the way from Hawaii. The man escorting this cargo is Reginald Montgomery. He's a scientist from the Bureau of Sugar Experiment Stations, an agency dedicated to boosting productivity of sugarcane. At this time, sugar is a thriving industry in Australia, and the tropical climate in this part of the country is ideal for growing cane. But there's a problem. Two native insects, the Frenchie beetle and the greyback beetle, have been attacking the crop, causing big losses for farmers. Montgomery's job at the Bureau of Sugar Experiment Stations is to find ways to control these pests. And that's what he's hoping his special cargo will do. You see, in the crates he has with him, there are 102 giant American toads, 51 males and 51 females, captured in Hawaii, sent by boat to Sydney, and then put on a train up to the northeastern state of Queensland. These amphibians, also known as cane toads, are native to Central and South America. The toads already had some success getting rid of pests in sugarcane plantations in Puerto Rico and other parts of the Caribbean. So why not try them in Australia too? The cane toads are brought to a facility near Cairns to breed. And breed they do. Just a few months later, in August 1935, 2,400 toads are released in Queensland's major sugarcane growing districts. To say that the toads take to their new home is an understatement. With a favourable climate and no natural predators, they begin to reproduce, and the population spreads and spreads. Ironically, the toads don't control the beetles in the cane fields. Farmers later resort to pesticides to do that job. But they do start wreaking havoc on Australia's native wildlife. That's because the toads are poisonous and excrete venom, which Australian animals haven't evolved to deal with. Native predators, such as goannas, snakes, skinks, crocodiles and quolls, fall victim to the toad's toxin. The populations of these species dwindle whenever cane toads arrive in a new area. Fast forward almost a hundred years to today. The cane toad is a major invasive species, and with hindsight, its introduction to Australia is seen as a huge mistake. It's difficult to say exactly how many toads there are, more than a billion, according to some estimates. They now populate much of the country's north. According to the government, they're advancing westward at about 60 kilometers per year. But this isn't a story about how giant toads came to Australia. It's about why. The toads were introduced in the first place to protect sugarcane. And that's because demand for sugar around the world was skyrocketing. Sugar was being produced on a mass scale and making up a bigger share of our diet. This rise of sugar accompanied the development of our modern world, impacting on our economies, the food we eat and the environment. The cane toads in Australia are just a small part of this picture. Today, sugarcane farming causes some 400 million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions each year, about the same as France. And cane crops, grown to meet our desire for sweet stuff, now cover an area bigger than the United Kingdom. So how did we get here? And more importantly, what needs to change when it comes to humanity's bittersweet relationship with sugar? I'm Neil King, and you're listening to DW's environment podcast, Living Planet. Sugar is in so many of the food and drinks we consume, from ketchup to cereal, salad dressing to yoghurt. It's hard to even imagine a time when this tasty sweetener wasn't so widespread. But for most of human history, people hardly ate any sugar. Early humans would have likely only eaten it occasionally in the form of seasonal fruits or honey. 
The first sugar granules made from processing the sweet juice of sugarcane are believed to have emerged in India about 2,500 years ago. This sugar refining technique then spread to other parts of Asia and the Islamic world. For a long time, sugar was considered a rare and expensive spice, only used by the very wealthy. It was also seen as a medicine to treat ailments such as stomachache. In Europe, indeed, sugar was just something that was consumed by princes, by aristocrats and perhaps by a few wealthy people in, in the cities. The rest of the people, they, they knew about sweetness, but it was uh, honey or grapes or what was available. And for the rest, the, the most common people hardly knew sugar until the late 18th century. Ulbe Bosma is a senior researcher at the International Institute of Social History in Amsterdam and a professor of history at Amsterdam's Free University. He's also author of the book The World of Sugar, How the Sweet Stuff Transformed Our Politics, Health and Environment Over 2,000 Years. We're going to pick this up again in the 15th century, because that's when things really begin to change. Portuguese colonizers start to cultivate sugarcane on a large scale for making refined sugar, first on the Atlantic island of Madeira, and then they introduce it to Brazil, where the tropical conditions are ideal for growing the crop. Plantations popped up in European colonies across the Caribbean, from Cuba to Barbados, Jamaica to Puerto Rico. Swathes of rainforest are cleared to make way for sugarcane monoculture. The labour required to farm these massive plantations comes from the transatlantic slave trade, which sees around 12.5 million people forcibly shipped from Africa to the Americas. Nearly two-thirds of these people end up working on sugar plantations. While all this is happening, across the ocean in Europe, the price of sugar is going down and consumption is shooting up. This sweet product, once only accessible to the rich upper classes, is beginning to enter the lives of common people, and it's becoming enormously popular. Sugar entered households over the course of the 18th century in coffee and tea and pastries and marmalades, but it was still very modest, a few kilos per year per person. At this point, sugar is being produced from sugarcane in warm tropical climates. Thriving plantations in Brazil and the Caribbean are helping to feed a sugar frenzy gripping Western Europe. And then comes the 19th century and we have the era of industrialization. Many people leave the countryside, go into the cities where they don't have their own yards, so they become more and more dependent upon industrially manufactured uh, food. And we see an industrialization of many things in our lives, but also of, of sugar. And sugar enters packaged uh, food because sugar gives texture, it gives sweetness, uh, it even preserves food. A discovery in Germany drives consumption up even further. A Prussian chemist called Franz Achard develops an industrial method to extract sugar from a root vegetable, the sugar beet, which can be grown in colder, more temperate climates in the Northern Hemisphere. He opens the first beet sugar factory in 1801, spurring a surge in sugar production in Europe. And that allows a sugar to enter the market in mass volumes. At the same time, prices go down rapidly. That means that more and more sugar becomes available to more and more layers of the population in greater uh, quantities. It was the most uh, traded commodity in the 19th century, so it performed the role of what oil is in the 20th century. The result, Ulbe says, was that over the last 150 years, sugar consumption jumped from just a few teaspoons a week to more than half a kilo in many countries. People became more accustomed to eating sweet things. In fact, sugar was seen as an important part of a healthy diet, a reliable source of energy. There are times every day as you work or you play when a pause would be welcome to you. And it's then that you find the bright thought in your mind that only a Coke will do. Soda fountains emerged in the US and soft drinks Coca-Cola and Pepsi came on the market. 
in the 1920s, the, the sodas, the ice creams, the luxuries become available. And after the Second World War, of course, the incomes rise further and further and all kinds of de delicacies like chocolate and cookies and, and ice creams become available on an almost daily basis for the large parts of the population, if not for everyone in Europe and the United States. Imperial sugar is quick dissolving. Imperial sugar is fine grain. Imperial sugar is 100%. Then came the growth of supermarkets and food advertising and consumption of sugar continued to rise. So whereas in the 19th century, sugar is still a kind of a household item that comes in coffee and tea and then in marmalade and pickles and, and that kind of things, in the, the, over the course of the 20th century, it's going into our industrial food, which ends up on our kitchen shelves. We go to the supermarket and many things in the supermarket are very sweet and sugary. And that, of course, also applies to the beverages. Most beverages uh, contain about 10% sugar in volume and in weight. A spoonful of sugar helps the medicine and then from the 1950s onwards, we see a steady increase. And then at the end of the 20th century, in the 1980s, 1990s, we see a kind of stabilization of sugar intake at a very, very high level. Ulber says the average American consumes more than 45 kilograms of sugar a year, over 120 grams a day. That's more than citizens in any other country. In Germany, it's around 33 kilos a year, similar to Australia and Brazil. In India, it's significantly lower, around 20 kilos per person. In China, 12 to 11 kilos, and in Nigeria, about 8 kilos. Around the time sugar-heavy foods began to play a bigger role in the Western diet, health problems also started to emerge. Tooth decay became more common, so did weight gain. But it was only around the 1950s and 60s that excessive sugar consumption and its link to obesity began to cause alarm in the medical community. We'll come back to that a bit later in the episode. For now, let's just say there are growing concerns about what gorging on sugar means for our health. But what about the impact of sugar on the environment? Sugar crops have left a mark on the places they've been farmed, from Thailand to Brazil, India to Australia, where cane toads continue to take a toll. Large-scale sugarcane monoculture, in many cases cultivated over centuries, dramatically reshaped these landscapes, leading to deforestation, biodiversity loss, pollution, soil degradation and erosion. In the 1500s, when the Portuguese brought sugarcane to Brazil, vast swathes of Atlantic forest along the coast were cleared to make way for the crop. Through the whole time, the Brazil was uh, part of the Portuguese empire, those roughly three centuries. There was more money made out of sugarcane in Brazil than the gold trade and then any other agriculture activities. Milton Aurelio Uber Jandrachi is an environment engineer originally from Brazil, but now based in Queensland, Australia. He says it's hard to describe what was lost at that time because there was no list of threatened species 500 years ago and no environmental impact assessments. Of course, one of the major impacts from the sugarcane farms is the amount of land it uses. So nowadays, it's between 9 to 10 million hectares of sugarcane crops in Brazil. That's the area it uses. That's the same size as Portugal, uh, the entire country's area <laughs> in Brazil is, is insane, isn't it? It's sugarcane farms. So it's about 15% of the agricultural land in Brazil is sugarcane. Brazil is the world's biggest sugar producer, followed by India, the EU, Thailand, China and the United States. Most of the sugar in our food, some 80%, comes from sugarcane. The rest comes from sugar beet. And sugarcane is also the largest global food commodity in terms of volume, ahead of corn, rice and wheat. Today, this crop covers around 27 million hectares. As I said at the start, that's bigger than the UK or the size of the US state of Colorado. The area planted has nearly doubled since 1960. 
and in that period, the amount of sugarcane harvested has quadrupled to around 2 billion metric tonnes a year. The crop is currently farmed in more than 100 countries, but even in places where sugarcane is no longer grown, like Hawaii, Ulbe says its legacy is still being felt. Particularly the, the sugarcane exhausts the soil. So um, within a few years' time, uh, the soil is exhausted. Unless you apply a lot of fertilizer, you have to leave that area and try to find a new area. So what is left if these uh, sugar plantations leave? Um, they leave a kind of, uh, of dry, sturdy grass, uh, which easily burns. And uh, some people may remember the wildfires in, uh, in Hawaii. Hawaii has been for many decades a very important sugar producer, but these sugar plantations were abandoned by the end of the 20th, to early 21st century. So what was left was these sturdy dry grasses. So when these wildfires started, they rapidly overrun uh, these uh, islands. So here we can really see what kind of ecological consequences uh, cane sugar production uh, has. Both sugarcane and sugar beet are thirsty, land-intensive crops. Farming sugarcane emits around 400 million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions each year, mainly from the practice of pre-harvest cane burning, synthetic fertilisers and fossil-powered machinery. The practice of burning cane brings down costs because it gets rid of the crop's top leaves, leaving ripe sugarcane ready to be harvested. But it's also a significant source of pollution for the sector. Cane burning sets whole regions under a thick layer of smoke. Now in Brazil that has been prohibited by the Lula government in the early 21st century. But it's still done, for example, in, in Thailand, uh, in which the population suffers from huge cane uh, burnings. And uh, that causes all kinds of respirational problems. And it's, it's not a good way, of course, to deal with, uh, with nature. Pre-harvest cane burning continues in other countries, in Thailand, as Ulbe said, but also in India and the US. Residents living near the cane fields in Florida's Everglades have launched campaigns to try to get American farmers to switch to greener practices. A study by researchers at Florida State University in 2022 found that fine particulate matter in smoke from cane burning in the area contributed to up to six deaths a year. And hundreds of thousands of people are suffering every year from severe respirational problems because of the cane burning. Researchers in Brazil, where cane burning is being phased out, found that doing away with the practice almost halved the amount of greenhouse gas emissions from farming sugarcane. Milton says using what's known as green harvesting instead, where the cane is extracted by machine, also improves air quality and the soil. He says the emissions have also dropped because sugarcane biomass that's not being burned in harvesting can be used to generate energy for sugar mills. So instead of just having that burning outside without any benefits, they're burning it inside the plants to generate uh, electricity. So that improves the environmental performance of the process as a whole. And then there's water use. According to the Water Footprint Network, which calculates the amount of water it takes to make products, one kilogram of refined sugar from sugar beets requires around 920 litres of water. To get one kilo of refined sugar from sugarcane, you're looking at around 1,780 litres of water. Sugar needs a lot of water, so that leads to dehydration. And dehydration is a big problem in the, in the huge sugar belt in, in West India, and it's one of the, the largest sugar-producing regions in the, in the world. It's important to note that most sugarcane crops are rain-fed. That's why they're typically grown in the tropics. A little over a quarter of cane's water needs are met with irrigation. In some countries, that's heaped stress on water supply, especially during droughts, which are expected to become more frequent with climate change. Milton says Brazil's sugar farmers mainly rely on rain. So the growers, the farmers, they plan their operations uh, in line with the rainy season. And that happens mostly in the southeast part of Brazil, which is the region that grows sugarcane the most. They've got a very defined rainy season and the farmers plan their operations in line with that season. 
uh, so they usually don't require irrigation on uh, on their farms. Meanwhile, runoff of nitrogen and other fertilizers from sugarcane farms has also affected ecosystems, including the Great Barrier Reef off Australia's coast and in Florida, the biggest producer of sugarcane in the US. Here's Ulbe. We have the Everglades there, that is the, the environmental uh, protected area, but the Everglades are seriously polluted by the fertilizers that are applied, and the pesticides that are applied to the, uh, the cane fields. Studies have also found that the draining of the Everglades wetlands to grow crops there has led to millions of tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions being released into the atmosphere every year due to peat oxidation and loss. It's, it's really it's not, not sustainable, I think, this, this way of sugar uh, production. And it is, is, is worse at this crisis because of the low sugar price. But steps are being taken in some countries to make sugar more sustainable. In Brazil, many farmers rotate their cane with other crops, like peanuts or soy, to improve soil biodiversity and reduce the need for fertilizers. There are also certification bodies that seek to ensure sugar is produced in an ecologically responsible manner. For example, there's Bon Sucro, which was founded in 2008 by the World Wildlife Fund, and other organizations like the Pro Terra Foundation, Fair Trade, and Organic. But sugarcane that complies with these standards only makes up around 8% of total global production. PepsiCo, one of the biggest buyers of sugar in the world, says it sources 100% of its sugar from certified sustainable sources. Another major buyer, Kellogg's, is aiming to source all of its sugar sustainably by 2030, as is Swiss company Nestlé. Coca-Cola has set a target for 100% sustainable cane sugar by 2025. Ulbe stresses, though, that sustainably produced sugar is still very much in the minority. The big sugar companies like Tate & Lyle in the, in the United Kingdom or Südzucker in, in Germany do have their fair trade uh, brands, which are ecologically responsible and also socially uh, responsible. But these brands are only a minute part of the entire production of uh, sugar. And since sugar prices are, are low, um, they do not allow for ecologically responsible uh, production. Let, let's say that's, that's a clear fact. So the bulk of the sugar is produced under environmentally bad conditions. The global sugar manufacturing industry was valued at around 78 billion US dollars in 2023 and some 175 million tonnes of sugar was consumed globally. According to the OECD, demand is only expected to go up. Ulbe says that given these projections, there's an environmental argument for reducing sugar in diets. We can say that only 2 to 4% of all arable land in the world is covered by cane or by beet. But usually they are quite good lands. They are really lands that have sufficient water um, so that's only applying to 20% of, of the world's arable land where sugar can be grown. Now, suppose that the Chinese and other people in the world in Africa would consume as much sugar as the Europeans uh, do. It would mean that about 6 or 7% of the world's best land would be covered by sugarcane. So this is also a, a really a, a serious uh, problem we are facing. So we hope that we can have a situation in which the sugar intake is, is generally uh, reduced because if everyone in the world consumes 40 kilograms of sugar per year, um, that's not sustainable, I think. We'll be right back after this short message. Can you hear me now? I'm Dr. Laurie Santos, and I'm devoting the new season of my podcast, The Happiness Lab, to topics that are dear to my heart, okay. with people dear to my heart, like my mom. Wait a minute, let me put the TV on. I'll be finding out why I personally struggle so badly with perfectionism, stress, and even sitting still and doing nothing. But I feel like I'm bad at boredom because you're bad at boredom. Yeah, no, I didn't do well with doing nothing. And once I find out why these things affect me so badly, I'm hoping to do something about it. So join me on my journey, wherever you get your podcasts. We did without sugar for most of human history, 
But now, around 180 million tons of sugar are produced per year. And much of this is added to the everyday foods we buy from the supermarket. These products aren't even always things we would think of as sweet. Cereals, pasta sauce, ketchup, candy, cake, cookies, apple juice, yogurt, chocolate, jam, soft drink, candy, soft yogurt, pancakes, ice cream, ice cream, sports drinks, 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 baked cereals. beans. The companies behind sugary foods spend a huge amount on advertising to try and keep our sweet tooth going strong. According to a 2022 survey of representatives of the American sugar and confectionery products industry, the sector spent around 551 million US dollars on advertising that year. Domino makes the sugar that makes America smile. Ice cold Coca Cola. There's no waistline worry with Coke, you know. Actually, when you're working hard and feel a bit peckish, stick out your hand for a Cadbury's double decker. Under that thick Cadbury milk chocolate, there's a unique... Sugar is embedded in our lives. It played a crucial role in the rise of industrial development, global trade, and shaped the history and culture of many countries. It gives us the energy our bodies need to function. Plus, it tastes great. We humans find it hard to resist. And that's no accident. Our brain basically is hardwired to like these foods. Dr. Amy Reichelt is a nutritional neuroscientist based in Canada who runs the nutrition consulting company Cognition Nutrition. She says every time we eat sugary foods, we experience an increase in dopamine, which helps enforce behaviours we need to survive as a species. This includes things like socialising, sex and also eating healthy but high energy foods because as our ancestors, as hunter-gatherers, having a good source of energy was fundamental to the ability of the species to survive because these things aren't as freely available in nature as we might think. Um, but what's happened in our modern society is that because these foods are now so abundant, it's almost as if our, our brain is now overwhelmed with the very presence of these foods that historically in the past were very scarce. The result, Amy says, is that our brain is adapting to the overabundance of sugar, and that's leading to a diminished feeling of reward, and that can drive overconsumption. So because of that, we're almost like chasing the dragon in a way, because if you're not getting the same reward initially, then what's happening downstream is that you just want to eat more and more of them to get the same reward. So you're becoming more tolerant to the, the rewarding capacity of these what were delicious foods. And this driving of overconsumption is causing us to consume excessive amounts of calories and may also shift then are food preferences towards these palatable yet less nutritious foods. But besides what's going on in our heads, another key point here is that eating too much sugar is also strongly associated with weight gain. And with rising rates of obesity and overweight worldwide, this is becoming important globally because obesity and overweight are linked to not only uh, increases in cardiovascular disease and you know, other cancers and shortening of the lifespan, diabetes, for example, as well, that this is then you know, causing you know, a crisis globally in terms of health. Adult obesity has nearly tripled since 1975, while obesity in children has increased almost fivefold. According to the World Health Organization, around 43% of adults are overweight and 16% are obese. The WHO estimates that by 2035, 1.9 billion people will be living with obesity, amounting to global economic costs of 4.32 trillion US dollars. In 2015, the UN Health Agency issued recommendations aimed to curb sugar intake. It advised that people should consume no more than 50 grams per day of free sugars. That's about 12 teaspoons. 
So this applies to sugars like fructose, sucrose and glucose that are added to food and drinks, as well as sugars in honey, syrups and fruit juices. The WHO said these sugars should ideally make up no more than 10% of one's total energy intake. But consumption in many Western countries is way above that. The average American, for example, eats more than double that amount. Ulbe says it's clear something has to change. At this stage, 42% of the population of the United States is obese, and that leads to diabetes type 2. You know, everything about the COVID pandemic, but it's not a pandemic which is slowly killing many people here in this world at this stage. So I think sugar production needs to be reduced anyway. I mean, there's no, there cannot be any person who can be against reducing uh, the, the average sugar intake in this world, particularly in the middle income and wealthy countries. But eating less sugar isn't so straightforward, given that it's in so many products. And as humans, we're drawn to sweet, calorie-rich foods. Introducing the new and improved taste of Pepsi Zero Sugar. Now more delicious. But what about sugar substitutes? Could artificial sweeteners help us out here? My name is James Suckling. I'm a research fellow at the Centre for Environment and Sustainability at the University of Surrey in the UK. Um, And I've been working as part of the Sweet Project, looking at the environmental impact of high intensity sweeteners or non nutritive sweeteners um, and trying to understand the ramifications of replacing added sugar um, with those sort of products in food and drink. During the fittingly titled EU funded sweet project, James looked at several sugar substitutes or non nutritive sweeteners, including stevia, sucralose, aspartame and neotame. The pros of these sugar substitutes are that they're zero calorie and come without the risk of tooth decay. And because they're super, super sweet, they can be used in tiny quantities. If you've had sugar-free soft drinks, then chances are you've had aspartame, an artificial sweetener that's about 200 times as sweet as sugar. Then there's neotame, which is 8,000 to 16,000 times as sweet. It's incredibly sweet which means you, you need milligrams to replace the amount of sugar. According to James's research, the fact that these sweeteners are so intense means they have a much lower environmental impact than regular sugar. So aspartame, for example, produces up to 89% less greenhouse gas emissions than regular sugar. Stevia, a natural sweetener that comes from a plant, produces as little as 10% of the emissions of sugar while neotame produces 99% less CO2. We also looked at other impacts that may occur. Uh, So, for example, ozone depletion, um, eutrophication, which is in effect a measure of runoff of nutrients from farmland and things like that, so nitrates and phosphates, water consumption, all those uh, metrics and more. And yeah, so on a sweetness basis, they tend to be lower environmental impact than sugar, which... I think it was a really interesting finding. So, in theory, replacing added sugars in our food and drinks with these sweeteners could significantly reduce the land use, water consumption and emissions associated with growing sugar beets and sugar cane. Artificial sweeteners are generally considered safe in limited amounts. But more research is also needed to determine the health effects of consuming them over a longer period. Ulbe believes artificial sweeteners are not the answer to dealing with the abundance of sugar in food, and that people could instead benefit from trying to reduce sweetness in their diet. As an historian, I I can see that we got used to more and more sugar and to more and more sweetness. So if we replace one type of of sweetener, the sucrose, by the artificial non-caloric sweetness, I don't think that is the solution to the problem. I think we have to work towards a a diet that's less sweet, and that will be really the the structural fundamental solution to our health uh, problems. Some governments have implemented measures to steer consumers towards healthier diets. For example, requiring sugary drinks to have warning labels or curbing advertising for high-sugar products. Dozens of countries, including the UK, South Africa, Norway, France and Spain, have introduced some form of sugar tax. And early evidence suggests it's having an impact. Two years after a sugar tax was implemented in Mexico in 2014, 
the purchase of sugar-sweetened drinks dropped by 7.6%. In Chile, restrictions on advertising and label requirements for high sugar products implemented in 2016 led to purchases of sugar-sweetened drinks dropping almost 25% in the first 18 months. The American Beverage Association has spent millions to shut down efforts to introduce soda taxes in U.S. states. It said such measures would hurt businesses and cost jobs. The U.S. Sugar Association, meanwhile, has said the World Health Organization's recommendation that free sugars make up no more than 10% of daily calories is misleading and not based on strong evidence. It warned linking a sugar limit to reduced disease risk could have an economic impact in developing countries. Sugarcane growing and processing employ more than 100 million people around the world. In India, the sugarcane sector provides rural livelihoods for around 50 million people. In Brazil, almost 800,000 people work in the sector. A drop in sugar consumption driven by sugar taxes, other measures and general health concerns would likely have significant consequences for the sugar industry as well as sugar crop farmers. The largest impacts on cane production would likely be felt in Brazil, China, India and Thailand and on beet farmers in countries such as Germany and the US. Ulber says sugar farmers might be better off growing other food crops altogether. Ultimately, he says, a big shift is needed in order to tackle the obesity crisis that's been centuries in the making. He wants to see a new food system for the sake of our health and the environment. This is not a matter of individual choice. My point of view is that this is an historical phenomenon, how our food system has been shaped over the past 150 years. We cannot isolate sugar and, and the, the questions of obesity and environment from seriously addressing uh, the entirety of our food system. And that's, I think, a very important conclusion we need to draw. And that does not mean that I'm against sugar or that sugar should disappear from our diets. I think it will stay, but I hope in less alarming quantities. This episode of Living Planet was researched and written by Natalie Muller. It was edited and produced by me, Neil King. Our sound engineer was Jonas Jorsten. If you have any questions or story suggestions, send us a voice message to livingplanet at dw.com. And please do also let us know if this episode has changed the way you see sugar. And while you're online, why not check out our YouTube channel called DW Podcasts. You won't just find Living Planet there, but also plenty of other great DW podcasts ranging from politics to culture. And if you want to listen back to this and other episodes of Living Planet, you can always subscribe to the podcast. It's free and easy to download. You can find us on all major podcasting platforms. Living Planet is brought to you by DW in Bonn, Germany. Mm -hmm.